wanted to go through and um, talk about a few different things that um, with dealing with Obamacare and um, and then kind of handle any specific questions that you guys might have uh, in regards to this topic. It's it's been a uh, it's been a very interesting uh, transition that we've made with uh, with the introduction of the Affordable Care Act and. Um, and I want to give you kind of a brief history that uh, this is this is people don't really do this and they don't really think about some of these things in terms of uh, Obamacare and um, and the Affordable Care Act, but it's really necessary to give you kind of an understanding of where we've come from in terms of uh, as a country to how we get here. Right. Uh, so the deal with the Affordable Care Act is that. This is the first time it's successfully been passed, right? In any real, in any real sense, the first uh, time we really saw this uh, was Medicare. In any successful sense, right? Um, but we also had Nixon Care and Hillary Care, and uh, you know, all. I mean, going back to just after uh, the inception of uh, the Federal Reserve System, the next big accomplishment on the table was to was a national health care system. So it goes back a very, very long way. Um, when you look at, and, and, and it's important for us, and I imagine that a lot of us are familiar with um, the inception of the Federal Reserve and right, just uh, right around the same time, the inception of the income tax, right? Um, and so you might be thinking, what in the world is, where are you going with this? Um, if you look at the history of tax rates in America, right? Um, what you'll find is that currently we're at one of the lowest tax rate and tax threshold times in our country. Right? Um, and it feels like we're taxed to death, but in terms of the rate and the threshold, um, it's one of the lowest we've ever been. Uh, and it's one of the lowest we've ever been for a sustained period of time. Uh, and so, um, generally speaking, if I'm dealing with my clients, and oh, I forgot to introduce myself, I'm Toby Pedford. Uh, I'm the CEO and principal agent of the Legacy Wealth Strategies Group in Oklahoma City, and um, uh, I'm talking about Obamacare, traps, uh, penalties, uh, ceilings, and escape routes. Legacy Wealth and what? The, the Legacy Wealth Strategies Group. Um, we do insurance, retirement, employee benefits, 401k, uh, life insurance, anything to do with people we do. Um, and uh, and I've, I've had a chance and opportunity to speak about Affordable Care Act um, at several different places around the state and universities. Um, and generally what I find is there's a lot of misconceptions, but really there's a, a lack, what I found is a lack of historical understanding to know what it is that they were actually trying to accomplish. Because we just hear the buzzwords that happen on TV and we hear, you know, guaranteed issue and people are going to be able to get insurance now. And, you know, and all that. Well, people were able to get insurance before, so there's something <laughs> not quite right about that. So, what's different now? So, um, so as we look at the the history of the income tax, what we see is that um, over over time, since its inception, we had higher rates, as high as I want to say 92 and 95 percent. Uh, we've had them lower. Uh, as well uh, than what they are right now. Um, specifically, uh, Reagan brought us down to um, something very close to, as close as we've ever been to a flat tax uh, in the history of our country. Um, worked very well in terms of generating, both, both generating tax revenue and making sure that you know you had a broad base of people, uh, people paying. Um, and now we've got a more graduated income tax with you know, up to higher uh, income levels. And um, so, if you remember, uh, in the build-up to the the Obama presidency, and since he's been president, there's uh, he has uh, talked over and over and over again about people that are in the one percent. If you're in the one percent of Americans, right? And he's defined that as if you make two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year or more. You're in the one percent, and you need to start paying your fair share. You're not paying enough, you know. Um, and so, uh, even though you're at the top tax rate, it's not enough, you know. Uh, and so they, so they want to get more out of the higher group of people. Okay. Um, if you listen to Mitt Romney, so this is not—I mean, it's not something that's 
that is unique to uh, Democrats or uh, by themselves. Uh, if you listen to Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney said, no, I like the tax rate, right? Or maybe we could even lower the tax rate, but we're going to broaden the base, right? So if you increase the threshold, you effectively raise taxes, right? So if I said, okay, well, right now the top tax rate is 35% on a federal level, but you have to be making $250,000 a year to get there, then most people are not going to reach that top tax rate, right? So, however, if I said the top tax rate is 35%, and if you're making $15,000 a year, that's what you're going to pay. What I've effectively done is I've increased the amount of people that are subject to that tax, and I'm going to increase the amount of taxation that is, the amount of income and revenue that's going to be coming in. So, oops, we're talking about sustainability. So. Your wife did it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so um, in both scenarios, and, and also if you kind of remember what um, Romney said um, and, and what Romney instituted in, uh, as, as when he was governor, we dealt with the, with the two parties that were both trying to tackle some of the same issues, right? One is that the, the state, uh, the federal government, does not feel that it has enough revenues. Um, whether you believe that to be true or not, that's, that's their perspective. And the reason that's their perspective is because, generally speaking, you had um, a time of, uh, of, uh, of warfare under the Bush presidency, right? of significant and uh, expansive warfare. And under the Obama presidency, we've had significant and even more expansive warfare, continuing the wars we were in and went into more. But what, what we never did, that we've always done in the past, is we never raised taxes during that, during that entire period. During the entire Bush presidency since he passed his tax cuts, and during the uh, entire uh, Obama presidency, by and large, and, I, and there's definitely been some tax increases, but, um, but by and large, what we mainly focus on, materially focus on, those tax rates and thresholds have not changed. Um, and so, the the next person that becomes president is going to have to answer the question of how do we drive revenue, right? How do we, where does the additional revenue come from? And so that's the, that's the kinds of uh, the things that keep me up at night, is wondering where do they feel like they're going to uh, uh, get this revenue from. Um, and if I can take just a minute to veer away from uh, Obamacare for just a second and uh, talk, uh, you know, to... You know, if I, have, I'm, I haven't done a good job scaring you about Obamacare, so let me do a good job uh, scaring you about your retirement plan for a second. If you participate in a 401k or a uh, IRA or a Roth or any type of qualified plan, uh, 403b, uh, whatever it is, you know, right? So what you effectively are doing, right, is you're making a deal with the government, right? And you say, all right, tell you what, I'll put my money in today, right? And what we hope is that, you know, when we put our money in and then when I turn 65 or I retire, I'm going to be at a lower tax rate, right? That's, that's what I'm assuming. I'm going to be at a lower tax rate. But what we, I mean, if, I'll just ask anybody in here feel like taxes are going down? No? Well, here's the problem. If you're at a, let's just say you're at the very top tax bracket today and you're at 35%, you put your money in at a 35% tax rate and you take it out, and we think that taxes are going up, and you took it out at a 50% tax rate. Did you win or did you lose that bet? <laughs> right? Wow. This stuff's going to have to be paid for because they're going to, I mean, especially as in the things that we're making these deals with the government on. Obamacare is the same thing. We're making a deal with the government. And one of the, you know, there's tens of thousands of pages of regulation in, uh, in Obamacare, and a significant portion of it, uh, in the beginning it was a, I mean, just a massive amount of the bill actually dealt with taxes more than it dealt with health care. And so, um, you know, back when, uh, back when, uh, before the bill had passed, um, I gave a, a talk at uh, a Tea Party rally about the Affordable Care Act. And it's always really hard to talk about insurance if, uh, it's hard enough for me, uh, I, I deal with both insurance agents that work with us, uh, on the wholesale side and directly with clients. And um, 
from my position, it's hard enough for me to explain to insurance agents what's going on from a mathematical standpoint, let alone, you know, 12 minutes at a tea party rally, you know, <laughs> here's, what's, here's what's going on, and you need to be excited, you know, and so, uh, so that didn't go, uh, I mean, the, the speech went well, but I will tell you, the, um, in terms of getting things across to people, what's actually happening when, when the government comes in, whether it's at a federal level or a state level, to come in and regulate an industry, generally speaking, what is happening is someone is being regulated out of the industry. Right. It's not as you don't really see a lot of regulations that come in that actually increase competition. However, that's what we were sold on. We're going to have more competition. We're going to have cheaper prices. We're going to have you know all these things, and none of it has turned out to be the case. And here's the reason why. So we talked about taxation. We talked about being at the lowest tax rate. Okay, but now we're going to come in with what is now uh, somewhere approaching a eight to nine trillion dollar entitlement that has come on to the to the system. You can't go from having, you know, a low tax rate, a huge the biggest entitlement the country's ever seen, and not figure out how you're gonna pay for it. So um, you obviously have not been paying pay attention to Obama, right? Yeah, we just print the money. Yeah, <laughs> we'll just print it till we figure it out. Um, so, so the vast majority of Obamacare or of of the focus of the lobbying had to do with taxation and building monopolies, right? So, um, so what do I mean, building monopolies? If you look at the state of Oklahoma, just the state of Oklahoma. Um, County by county is how you're able to determine what uh, products are available to you on a on a purchasing basis. So um, I, as somebody who lives in uh, in Oklahoma County, have uh, several companies available to me, right, that I can purchase from. Okay. Um, here in uh, Carter County, that's not the case. In fact, I believe in Carter County, your only option is Blue Cross and Blue Shield. In many counties around the state, the only option is Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Oklahoma. Right? Um, the other companies were not able to sustain the exchanges across the state on a statewide basis. And so what functionally happened is that, that the vast majority of people in the state of Oklahoma, if they are not now, will be insured by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Oklahoma. And the other companies will go out of out of the state of Oklahoma or out of business. I mean, huge companies like United, uh, like Aetna, they won't go out of business, but they will go out of the state. Um, if you don't have any distribution, if you don't have any clients, or if you have very little, what you start to get is what's called adverse selection. So if I have, uh, so if I live in Carter County and my doctor accepts Aetna and I've got cancer, well, I'm going to buy the Aetna policy because my, my doctor accepts Aetna. Doesn't matter how much it costs. Right, um, but Aetna is not available everywhere, and they're maybe more expensive, and you know, and so I just keep it. Well, all the people that are healthy, and all the people that you know uh, are making decisions that have nothing to do with their actual care are going to shift to the lowest possible price plans, right? Which is going to be Blue Cross and Blue Shield, which means that Aetna, all they have now is me and my health condition, right? Which means that Aetna is going to be stuck with that. Is until until I die or decide to or get healthy or decide to move off of that plan. So adverse selection means that you have a, a book of unhealthy business that you continue to get that continues to get more and more and more and more expensive until the company either can't sustain it um, and has to close or sell that that block um, to a company that can sustain it or um, they just go into receivership and it's taken over by the state guarantee fund. So, um, in in that's why you don't see choices across the majority of the state of Oklahoma. If you live in a, in a you know uh, urban metropolis, then you've got you know uh, you've got choices. But um, what we're seeing, and, and uh, by and large, is a monopoly to. Um, the Healthcare Services Corporation, or to Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Oklahoma. All right, so um, we talked about monopolies, which I really wanted to cover, and it's, I mean, and it's going to get worse. So it's not going to get better. There is no competition being 
uh, being brought into the state um, and into most states. There's not a lot of innovation going on. Um, uh, part of the reason for that is because the health care bill, um, and you know, it's really a misnomer to call it a health care bill because it didn't really address health care. Um, it addressed health insurance, right? Um, and uh, and how it, and it regulated health insurance, who's going to get it, and all these kinds of things. And it's done some things about uh, that that actually have made care more restrictive in hospitals and who can provide it, and you know these kinds of things. Um, it, it's built in some things that uh, uh, we, we know Sarah Palin was right about. Um, quality of care or however they want to determine it, death panels, right, is what that functionally is. Um, and so you guys have heard about those things, but what we what we really have to look at is what is happening to the market. Because the market itself is what is going to truly determine the care available. If you if you close the market and you grant monopolies, then there is no incentive to innovate. There is no incentive to provide better care to provide higher compensation to doctors or whatever you want to say that would drive the, and you can pick a factor, pick a, a quantitative factor that would drive the quality of care up, right? Uh, and so uh, because of that, I think what we're going to see is is less care, less availability. We're already seeing doctors um, shifting towards uh, cash payment and non-acceptance of payment. And so um, let me cover one other thing here on, on this section when we talk about traps, and that is networks. Um, so uh, in my practice, a lot of times I will meet people that say, well, I want uh, United, or I want, or I have said in the past, I want uh, Aetna, or I want Humana, or whatever it is. I want Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Uh, and the reason why is because their doctor accepts it, right? So who your doctor accepts it doesn't really have anything to do with health insurance. It has to do with how much they get paid from that company. That's why they're in network. So what they get reimbursed from the health insurance company is what determines whether or not they accept that health insurance company, right? So um, Blue Cross and Blue Shield has lower uh, uh, reimbursement rates to doctors, but they have a, lot, a much bigger patient base, right? So it's an easier way for doctors to do marketing. They get on a, on a list and, you know, if you're, they're in your area, then, you know, search them out, I need a pediatrician, Who's, who, who takes Blue Cross and Blue Shield, right? Uh, and so, uh, because what we're really dealing with are reimbursement rates, as claims get higher and higher, like we talked about, right, as claims get higher and higher, reimbursement rates, reimbursement rates for doctors will continue to go down. As those continue to go down, at some point, it's not worth it for the doctor to be in network, that, you know, if they're in network, they're losing money versus, uh, you know, versus actually being able to make money at their profession. They went to school for however long for in residency and all these kinds of things. So believe it or not, doctors are actually in that business to make money. I'm sure, you know, all of them care about people. All of them are in a very honorable profession. But if they don't make money, uh, then they're not in that profession anymore. So um, what happens is more and more we're going to start seeing these concierge doctors, uh, cash pay doctors, and you can still have insurance, and the insurance may reimburse whatever they're going, to re they're, going to, they're going to pay for, but the doctor will bill whatever they want to bill as well. So I think we're going to see a lot more of what's called balance billing. If you guys have ever gotten a balance bill in the mail where you go and have a procedure done and um, there's an amount left over that you still have to pay, we're going to see a lot more of that, and it's going to be higher percentages uh, than we've seen in the past. Uh, because it kind it just kind of has to be. Um, uh, and so uh, so that's kind of where our traps lie. When it comes to talking about ceilings, um, there are a significant amount more taxes within the, uh, within the Affordable Care Act and that have come about because of the Affordable Care Act. And um, there's some great articles I would point you to um, the 33 new taxes in Obamacare, uh, if you will give a Google search for that. There, there are some, some new taxes in regards to everything from uh, payroll taxes to real estate sales and capital gains. Um, I mean, things that have that you would not think have anything to do with health care, because they don't, right? But there's just more ways 
for um, uh, for the government to collect tax dollars, do some fundraising, and uh, and pay for more of this uh, of this bill. Um, let's talk about penalties because I know that's a big a big uh, concern. Does anybody here own a business? Any CPAs or anything here? Okay, pay the business. Right. Um, we got some some. Uh, some county uh, officials coming in, in, incoming county officials. Uh, and so um, so let's talk about penalties for a second. Um, penalties are, uh, by and large, let's talk about the business side first. On the business side, it primarily affects businesses that have 50 or more employees. Um, and so, uh, which is a, a small percentage of businesses uh, in, the, in the scope of things, right, in the scope of employee ranges. Um, they're still small businesses, but uh, but the farther away you go from 10 employees, the, the less and less percentage-wise you get. So you get 50 employees and you get a waiver for about 30, and there's some part-time, full-time calculation that has to go on there. I'm not going to really deal in that. The penalty for, uh, in 2014 for, uh, or 2015, for not offering health insurance. So it's required that the employer offer health insurance. The penalty is $2,000 a year for not offering it. The average premium right, for an employee is about $3,600 a year. So a lot of employers, what we've seen is that they have decided that it was cheaper for them to not offer insurance than it, and pay the penalty than it was to offer insurance. Um, some employers, and I think this is probably the more um, uh, responsible employer, and not just responsible, but also um, realistic employer, is choosing to offer coverage because of what coverage does. It does, and it does a lot of things from uh, increasing productivity to employee morale and distinguishing them from their competitors and, and so on and so forth. And, and it gives them a pretty substantial tax deduction as well. Um, so all of those things, um, what we're finding of the employers that are choosing to offer coverage, uh, the coverage is, is being pushed back uh, in terms of deductibles, you know, greater and greater deductibles, greater coinsurance within the limits of the Affordable Care Act uh, so that um, they can, you know, keep their premiums down because the premiums have jumped substantially. Uh, keep their premiums down while still giving their employees uh, some type of coverage. I hear from the employers that offer coverage most often, um, if I don't offer it to them, they'll never go get it. And as soon as something happens, they're going to be in a really bad way, and I don't want to see that happen. So I see a lot of employers that are, that are compassionate, care for their employees, and the tax deductions that occur. So, um, so penalties on the business side, um, there's a lot of ways to deal with that. Where it really starts to rub is in the uh, employer groups that are, let's say, um, I won't name any names, but I talked to a, a, a barbecue chain here in, uh, in Oklahoma, Oklahoma uh, started, um, and uh, they have about 300 employees, okay? um, and they do different things from disaster relief to, uh, to uh, their restaurants, and um, of that 300, about 60 are corporate employees. Now, the 60, cur uh, the 60 corporate employees currently had health insurance, and the other 240 were waiters and waitresses. Yeah. Um, now, waiters and waitresses work on tips for 213 an hour or so, right? and that's where the majority of their income is derived. They work full time, but they don't, you know, uh, the their wage is, is much lower because they're primarily tip, they work on tips. So for that employer, their health insurance cost was going to jump by over a hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, like that. I mean, it was by a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. So because they would they would be required to offer health insurance to these, you know, to these people. So um, huge at the same level that they offer it to the sixty corporate employees. Right? Now. Uh, the argument has continually been that, okay, well, you know, yes, but 
those employees would have access to the marketplace and they'd have access to subsidies and so that's where they'll go get their insurance. Um, but the truth of it is that most people have always, especially in that category, if they were going to buy uh, health insurance in any way, were going to buy it through their employer. Um, they're not going to get online, as we've seen through the actual enrollment, you know, they're not going to get online and try to figure out for the next three hours how to, uh, how to enroll in a subsidy program based on an income that fluctuates and part of it's based on tips that they don't want to claim and part of it, you know what I mean? So, um, so the penalty then falls to, uh, to that employer. Now there's some, there's some ways out to talk about those. Um, on the individual mandate, um, so I kind of, on the individual mandate and that penalty, I also kind of uh, include this in the trap section, right? Because the truth of it is, um, uh, I don't really feel like most people, sh at least in Oklahoma, I don't feel like the majority of Oklahomans should be super concerned about the penalty, uh, the individual penalty. So let's, let's talk about what it is and, and why uh, and why not. Um, so if, let's talk about why, why you wouldn't have to pay a penalty first, because that's probably the, the easier place to start. Um, so if you're Native American, right, in Oklahoma, you don't have to pay a penalty, period. Right? You, got a, you got a tribal roll card, no penalty. If you um, have access to the VA, you don't have to pay a penalty. If you, um, or, or TRICARE for that matter, um, if you have our insurance for your employer or individually, you know, then you don't have to pay a penalty. If the, and this was really the big one, was if the premium for bronze level plan exceeded 8.5% of your adjusted gross income, then you don't have to pay a penalty. Um, so uh, as we look at our, you know, the, the average uh, premiums in Oklahoma against the average wages in Oklahoma, um, then most of Oklahoma is not going to have to pay a penalty if we, you know, if we just look at those two things. And I'll give you a good example. For a, for a 50 year old um, in, uh, in the state of Oklahoma, uh, their premium would be, you know, for, uh, for that level of insurance. And this is broad, you know, so don't quote me on this, but it's, I'm going to say about $500 to $520 a month for an individual, right? Uh, maybe as low as $470, but right, in that ballpark. Um, so let's just call it $5,200 to $6,500 a month or a year. Okay. Uh, so for a person that makes, you know, uh, $30,000 a year, $27,000 a year, you're already over. You don't have to pay a penalty. Now that doesn't mean you don't buy health insurance. It just means the penalty is not a concern. You know. Uh, and so uh, by and large, I, we haven't really had to had to think too much about that. Then on the other side. Um, for the people that do have to worry about a penalty. So what is it? What is it in 2014, for, or for 2014, you paid it in 2015. Um, it's $95 uh, per person, up to a family max of $285, or 1% of your income. And so I would always tell people, okay, well, let's just figure off a 1%. Let's assume that 1% of your income is the greater number, right? And let's say that you do really good in Oklahoma and you make $50,000 a year. Okay? So your penalty is 500 bucks. Right? So, I mean, you know what I mean? So as, as especially for my liberty-minded friends and, and, and those people, you know, kind of weighing out, you know, what are my options here? This is something I don't want to do. I don't want to participate. Um, how much is it going to cost me not to participate? Well, let's, let's go with 1% of your income. Now, uh, then the argument, there's another ceiling here, and it's uh, up to the cost of that bronze level plan. So I do have some people who uh, chose not to participate and um, who bought other types of health insurance and, um, and have said, you know, I just, I'm going to pay that penalty. And we'll talk about kind of what not participation means. Um, it's up to, now I've had one case where I had somebody that, you know, made a significant income uh, in the seven figures, and they said, you know, so it's going to cost me, you know, six thousand dollars a year not to participate. I said, yep, I said, do it. Let's. So the I, I haven't really seen uh, on the on the graduated scale, 
you know, uh, very much concerned uh, about the penalty. It's really, in my estimation, much ado about nothing. Not to say that nobody's going to have to pay it, it's just that uh, it doesn't seem to be that big a concern. And let me throw this out there as well. That is after all of your adjustments. So it's not your gross income, it's your modified adjusted gross income. So all of the adjustments you take for your standard family deductions, your uh, your home, and everything else, when you get, it's after all of that. Hmm. So if you make $50,000 a year, you're probably only taxed on, you know, let's say 38, 36, right? So it's out, out of that number, not the gross number. Okay? Um, and I, like I said, I, it's, it, I love being able to, to give this to you guys, and, and, and it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things that uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of information, you know, tens of thousands of pages of, re of regulation. We won't go through all of them tonight. But I do want to make sure that you get some of the highlights because there's a lot of uh, scare tactics you're, that we've seen and more you're going to see. We thought you saw them last year. This year, when we get to open enrollment, it's going to be, it's going to be crazy. Um, and the advertisements and the enticements to get in, involved um, are going to be even greater than they have been in the past. So, um, just kind of letting you know what you know what's what's really at stake. Um, the penalty is a graduated penalty, so it, next uh, in 20, for 2015 for tax year 2015 it will be higher. Tax year 2016 it'll be higher. Um, but let me come back to 2014 for a second and just say as well, it sounds like the government's not going to enforce the penalty. Uh, this year anyway. So uh, we had all these people that, <laughs> that uh, uh, if you remember all the issues with the website, um, and they were saying just go enroll, just go enroll and we'll, you know, we'll fix that part and then the other, you know, 70% that still wasn't done, we'll just worry about that as we go, right? And that's <laughs> kind of where they've been. And we haven't, I haven't seen an update on how how ready it is. I think the last thing I heard was about 80, 85 percent ready, but we had some significant glitches. Um, and the, the glitches came from, well, there's a few. If, if you remember, if you guys have ever heard Amanda Teagarden uh, talk about the information exchanges. So we talk about exchanges, there's actually two kinds of exchanges. There's a health insurance exchange and then there's an information exchange. The information exchanges were supposed to be built first and in a lot of states they were. But they're a prerequisite to the health insurance exchange because the health insurance exchange, when you go in there and you remember you put in, if, I'm sure none of you guys tried this, but if you, <laughs> if you, if you went in there and you tried your, um, you have to put in your tax information and all, all of these things for the purpose of it connecting your information via database to the Oklahoma Tax Commission and to the IRS and to the OSBI and all these things. And so that as your employer reported your your wage and you filed your taxes, they'll be able to true those things up with what your income was and display for you the plans available because of your taxable income, which they hope to have already had access to. Well, that didn't happen. So um, because we said no to the money and, and, and a lot of great things that we need to continue to say no to, um, that never got built in Oklahoma and it never got built in a lot of states. That affected uh, a huge amount of things, but primarily when you went in to, to, to pick a plan, it's kind of, you know, the honor system right now. You just kind of <laughs> tell them what you make, and they just have to believe you, and they present you with uh, this tax credit, uh, uh, which is the, the, the premium subsidy. So um, what happened is, is now if you, if you purchase a plan and you get a subsidy for it, uh, that subsidy is a tax credit, right? So it's really important, you know, I've had a lot of people that thought that the plans got cheaper because they didn't make as much money. The plan costs what it costs. I mean, insurance is run on numbers and, and you need a certain amount of money coming in to pay for a certain amount of claims going out. That's just, that's just how it is. Traditionally, the insurance companies have made, you know, uh, have posted 3 to 4% profits. That's, I mean, over over a very long history. Well, the way that, that happens is they look over the course of about 10 years, figure out how much claims they're going to have to pay, add 4% on top of it, and ta-da, you got a premium, right? Like, that's not, <laughs> it's not that hard, but, um, that, so that's not going to change, right? So what happens is the government pays their subsidy based on income. So if I've got, if I'm, 
you know, 50 years old and I've got a $700 premium and I make uh, $16,000 a year, well, my premium, what I pay, might be $18 a month. But the government pays the rest of it. Okay. So here comes the question, what if I'm wrong about my income? And when you say the government pays the rest of it, the rest of it you mean we pay the rest of it? Yes. Yes. We, the people, pay the rest of it by a tax dollar. And, and it's, well, sorry. What's supposed to be done is, it's, or what was supposed to be done is supposed to be trued up on the back end. And all the mechanisms were supposed to be there, all the technology and infrastructure was supposed to be built for that delivery system to happen. Well, that didn't, since it didn't happen, now it's the honor system. And so um, when we talk about your, you know, your modified adjusted gross income, uh, if you today uh, make a certain wage, and let's say next month, you know, good old Uncle Jimmy, you know, uh, keels over, leaves you an oil well. Yay! Excellent. But, remember, it's a tax credit. It's a tax credit that's given in advance. It's not given to you, it's given to the insurance company on your behalf. So you will owe that money back if your income changes to the positive. Right? If your income changes to the negative. Uh, so let's say I'm that same guy and I make you know, $16,000 a year. Now, um, let's assume that I'm self-employed. Right? So this number is a fluctuating number. And this is a real example and this is why I give it to you. Um, I had a client that came in to me, gave me this, this exact scenario, um, and I said, well, what is, what is your, uh, what is your income adjusted been, you know, for the last few years? He said, well, I brought my taxes with me. I'm going to see my CPA right after I see you. I said, great. And I looked in, and he was showing that he, after adjustments he made right at $11,000 a year. Well, for him and his wife, that meant he didn't qualify because in, uh, built into the Affordable Care Act as well, was Medicaid expansion, right? In Oklahoma, we didn't do Medicaid expansion. Via the exchanges, you were supposed to be, based on your income and all the magic that's supposed to happen on the back end, automatically enroll you in Medicaid, right? Well, we didn't do that. We chose not to do that, and we should continue to choose not to do that. But because of that, what happens is, now that $18 premium I had when I made $16,000 a year says, no, you're not eligible, which means that that $7,400 or whatever it is that had been paid in subsidy for him over the year, had he done that, he would have owed it back. Now, this is a guy oh. that didn't have it, right? So, like, he didn't, he wouldn't have had it to, to give back. But that's the way tax credits work. If you either qualify for them or you don't. Wow. If you, if you fudge the numbers, which a lot of people this year have done, and they're, they're saying that, you know, a lot of people may not owe the penalty, but I guarantee you they will come back for those tax credits. And so the, there's, a, there's a huge number of people out there saying, and they've been, they've been guided by navigators and so forth, to just, and we've seen the videos of uh, uh, that young guy, and I can't remember his name, where uh, he did all the stuff on Acorn and everything. Uh, oh, yeah. You guys may remember his name. I don't remember his name, but you know, going into the navigators and different CPAs and, and all these folks that have have said, look, you know, we can't tell you to lie about your income, but if you do, you're gonna you're gonna get it paid for, right? So people go, well, their natural tendency is to defraud the government. Why not? Sure. How are they gonna you know? How are they gonna know, right? So <laughs> they go in there, they do it, and even though this magic isn't trued up, when you when you turn in your tax return. The IRS has hired 16,000 some odd new agents to true this stuff up, to find out, okay, this is, what you, uh, this is what you put on your tax return, this is what you put on your Obamacare filing, right? And we're off by this much money, and since we gave it to you in advance, we need to take it back. And the way they take it back is through your tax return. Okay. So you're saying the magic on the back end is more government. It's more government, and it. But what I'm referring more to agents. specifically is the is the software you. databasing infrastructure that was supposed to they intended to be built to support. Well, all what I was people. saying was you were saying what they had to do is hire how many thousand more? Sixteen thousand. So that, that was the magic. That's not that the was back the end. magic in the back end. That's they, not they the back end. That's actually agents. that's actually the current. So so they needed the back end or they needed the 16,000 to true up what the back end didn't do. So, so either way, we we're going to get more government with the whole thing. 
Some of it came because of Bush. Some of it came came because of uh, because of Obama. So you, it's it's tough to really call it Obamacare because they kind of work together on it. Um, and so uh, this is this has been uh, in the works for a very long time. Um, and um, when we talk about uh, kind of what's at stake to a person's income uh, and to their tax penalties and these kind of things, I don't actually think that the the penalty for non-participation is as significant, well, it's not, as significant as the penalty for being wrong about your income. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, uh, because they like may not chase down budget. the penalty. The, if they chase down the penalty, you, what you have is a is a, a terrible news story, right? Oh, they're coming after the little guy. We didn't make enough money or we chose not to participate. They're forcing us to do this. That's a hard story on the news. But what's not a hard story is you wouldn't imagine how many tax cheats there are out there. <laughs> you know, they would play that all day long and, and feel great about it, you know. Uh, because, you know, they're all, remember, they're out to get their fair share. They're out to shore up all this money that we're at the lowest tax rates in it and so on and so forth. We have wars to pay for. We haven't paid for. We've been kicking the can, right? <coughs> okay. Um, so, I've sufficiently scared you, so that's fine. We're going <laughs> Nice. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. So, let's talk about, let's talk about um, escape routes. Um, and there are several. Um, let's talk about on the individual side first. The, the first thing is, and, and I've got a lot of friends that, uh, and, and, and colleagues that talk about uh, nullification. Well, the first uh, you know, uh, level of nullification is non-participation. Just don't, don't participate. I mean, that's thing number one. That's the easy one. So here's the insurance guy saying, you know, one of your options is not to buy insurance. Okay. Um, and, and that's definitely an option. Uh, I am, I am not a proponent of not being insured. Uh, I feel like it's dangerous, and uh, as we look at, you know, the rates of, of bankruptcy, we can see that about two-thirds of those uh, people who go bankrupt in this country go medically bankrupt, and it's generally for something less than 10000 bucks. right? So um, my encouragement is to be, uh, is to be insured. But you can, there are uh, policies in which you can be insured for health and health events um, and not be in an Obamacare policy. Um, and generally those fall under what they call, uh, what the Affordable Care Act characterizes accepted benefits. Benefits that don't meet the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, mandates. Um, things like the 10 essential benefits, things like uh, uh, the wellness benefits and so forth. And um, with those, there's really no, um, I will, you know, be 100% forthcoming and tell you that my primary insurance is a non-affordable uh, non, uh, care act qualified plan. So you have to pay the penalty in that case? I will have to pay the penalty. Or I'll have to deal with it. Let me rephrase that. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to deal with it. But generally speaking, um, you know, uh, the way that it's, I'm either going to have to pay the penalty, but I mean, I'm self employed, so I'll have my adjustments and I'm not super concerned about it. And, you know, part of the other thing when you go with a, a plan that is um, an accepted benefit is that um, the other two big things that happen in Obamacare that, that we really talked about were guaranteed issue and no pre existing. Well, that's not a concern for me. You know, I'm fairly healthy, my family's healthy. Um, I've had one major disability uh, about 12 years ago now um, that we went bankrupt over. So I know the, I mean, I know the, the downside of it. Um, uh, and but since then, I've been, you know, absolutely healthy. I've had like, maybe one doctor's appointment in 12 years, something like that. Uh, I believe in being covered because I've had that. I know what it's like. Um, but. When, when, I'm, when I give the insurance company the ability to underwrite me and to refuse me coverage, uh, well, at least initially, let's say, uh, you know, uh, what it does is it drops the price substantially, more than 50%. So um, those are prices I'm willing to pay. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, the other thing is... Um, the Affordable Care Act removed uh, annual benefits and uh, lifetime benefits. Um, and so I'll give you an example with my policy that is on myself. 
I've got uh, $250,000 of annual benefit, and I've got a $5 million lifetime benefit. Well, um, the Healthcare Cost Institute um, comes out with reports on utilization and uh, expenditures per capita every year in America, right? Well, uh, in 2013, the, uh, the per capita healthcare expenditure for a family was $4,331. So, if I know that the average deductible in a major medical policy and Affordable Care Act policy now has approached $5,000, I have to realize that if I were to buy one of those, I would be self-insured because even if we're just spending it per capita, which we're not, we'd still be inside of our deductible. Well, the deductible is the amount of money you have to pay before the insurance company pays a dime. So I would pay my premium, which would be double what it is right now, and I would pay the $4,331 that we would be out. So I'd effectively be self-insured. Now, if I hit the lottery and I had one of those, you know, major expenditures that I'd have to hit um, to, you know, make an unlimited benefit worthwhile, then, you know, I'd be singing that plan's praises. But, um, you know, the odds of it are just, I mean, it's, it's actually less than 3% that that would ever happen to anyone. So, um, when I use the phrase hitting the lottery, I mean, I, I mean it. And so um, for, for people who are right now, the, my advice is if you need to be insured, go with an, a, a policy that's an accepted benefit, defined benefit, accepted benefit, and, uh, you know, get something that you're actually going to use and that you would actually need and not the stuff that you don't. If we know that what they sold us on was, you know, pre-existing, uh, no pre-existing conditions, guaranteed issue for everybody, then I know that if I get one of those things, that they're going to have to take me with no pre-existing and guaranteed issue for everybody. And I'll take that claim to the monopoly company, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, uh, in, in my county if I live in a rural area, and I'll let them have it. And they're okay with that. Right? So I'm going to let them be okay with what they with, with that, and I'm going to be okay with what I've got. Um, and I'll deal with the, you know, however big our penalty. Um, so, um, so accepted benefits, defined benefit policies are um, are huge. There's some legislation that we need in our state uh, specifically to kind of shore those up back to where they were. Um, what was happening in the oh, Daily Oklahoman had a great piece about it, and I hope that my brokerage had a whole lot to do with this. Um, but there was a big piece in the Daily Oklahoman right before the. Uh, rollout of, uh, of or no, it was right after the rollout of Obamacare, that um, said that there was agencies in the state that were selling these policies that were accepted benefit policies, and they were getting all the healthy people, and they were, it was like they were trying to sabotage the law. And I, I just kind of thought, you know, I'm not trying to sabotage anything, but, <laughs> you know, but yeah. I'm taking as many as I can. Yeah, you know? yeah. And so, um, you know, but, um, for those people that are generally healthy and don't mind being underwritten, you know, um, there are less expensive policies that are not Obamacare. There are several companies that offer those, um, and I won't use uh, this platform to kind of talk about companies or anything like that, but to just let you know that there are other options out there than, uh, than Obamacare. Um, there are the rise of uh, what's called a direct medical care. Um, some of these are more robust than others. This can be a, uh, well, before I hit this one, let me deal with um, the MediShare uh, environments, like the Christian MediShare type deals, if you guys have heard of those. Um, and there's, they're becoming more and more popular. I'm not a fan um, for several reasons uh, that just have to do with business practice and actual risk. Again, you, even though it's not likely that I'm going to hit the lottery, it's possible I might hit the lottery. It's possible that, that a bunch of us hit the lottery. Uh, and because it's not an insurance company, it's not subject to the same types of uh, practices that insurance companies are. Um, and so, uh, or which specifically has to do with reserving, right? So I know that my insurance company has a certain amount of money held aside to pay claims. Uh, in the Christian MediShare uh, type deals, they don't really have to do that to the same degree. So, um, you know, if my premium is one thing today, and their experience is bad, it may jump mid-year to whatever they need to cover expenses, um, or they may not be able, they may tell me they can't cover all my expenses because it's too, my procedure or whatever is too expensive. 
I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that anybody put themselves in that situation because um, it's just it's at least at this point it's there's too many unknowns in it and the premiums aren't that different than major medical people are doing it because they want to be um, away from Obamacare but um, I, I wouldn't necessarily tell you that that's all that worthwhile now direct medical care is something we're seeing a big rise of um, there's some networks here in uh, in uh, Oklahoma that are that are growing there and what they are is if you let's say you had a doctor that said you pay me a certain fee every month whatever it is 20 bucks 30 bucks um, and I'll see you for all these things you know uh, and you just come in whenever you got something going on and maybe you pay me another ten dollars when you come in or something like this and you know we'll treat you whatever we can treat in this office right? those I think we're going to see an explosion of um, and depending on your risk level those can be a really good uh, a really good uh, model to go after um, I think what uh, the, the most powerful ways that that's working is where you've got companies doing it and it's working in mass right so there's one company again I won't talk about any specific tell you any company names, but there's one specific company based out of Oklahoma City that um, covers a thousand codes of medicine, uh, 14 or so doctors, 12 specialists, um, and, uh, you know, uh, McBride Clinic, Surgery Center of Oklahoma, um, the Heart Hospital, you know, so it has some great, uh, great access. And for those access in the thousand codes of medicine, so out of a thousand out of 10,000, but they're the thousand most commonly used. Uh, it costs you like 50 bucks a month, right? And then um, when you go see the doctor, it's like 20 bucks. Well, the difference because of that model is that if you need to go get an MRI, anybody guess that a, anybody had an MRI or know how much they cost? No guesses. Thousands. How much? Thousands. Thousands, yeah. So 1,500 bucks, something like that, 15 to 2,700 dollars. In the EPO model, uh, you need an MRI, 50 bucks. You need a colonoscopy, 50 bucks. You know, uh, blood work, 30 bucks. You know. So, uh, and it's because, and, and everybody's getting paid, everybody's getting paid well, but you have a much more limited uh, scope of, uh, of access, you know, providers. Now, think about this. If you don't, if you, if you stay in, you know, in the area, or you get service in Oklahoma City or whatever, you know, um, what is the, how many doctors do you see? I mean, you, not many. One, two, maybe three. Right, so you don't need a lot of doctors, you know. I and I, I've, it's always cracked me up, you know, in the on the from the distribution side, right? You know, people go, well, you know, uh, they don't have a lot of doctors. I'm like, how many of them? Do you, need? you know, it's got like fifteen thousand doctors. How many? How many do you want? <laughs> you know, and uh, but you're only going to use one or two, you know. So um, and these are great doctors. So um, you got to have high quality doctors in it to to make it work. Um, so that that's absolutely an, an option. Um, on the business side, um, and I think this is really where we're going to see the most innovation, and this is where where the numbers start to work to drive down cost, to actually start driving down costs um, uh, when we talk about opting out. So all of those things are not qualified benefits. You still have to deal with the uh, with the penalties and so forth. Um, and so uh, there's there's some innovative products that I think we'll see over the next year, year and a half, as the premiums continue to rise on. Affordable Care Act qualified plans uh, that we'll see some more innovation. But in the business side, um, some of the things that we're seeing are the rise of uh, of these types of products delivered through cafeteria plans. So we have a process in our agency by which we're able to transition payroll taxes. And I'll keep this as light as I possibly can. Uh, transition payroll taxes to pay for these benefits so that it costs the employees and the employers zero, right? Well, if I'm going into a business that's, that can't afford their major medical premiums or whatever, I'm happy to go in and deliver these products. And, you know, the average employee has about 200 or so, 200 $300 to spend on these benefits, but it's not going to it's going to cost them about that much anyway to get covered. So there's definitely options on the business side for them to be able to opt out as a business um, at, a, at whatever size to be able to deal with that. And then also, um, as we talked about the EPO model, 
we're also able to use that in what's called a self-funded or self-insured plan. Now, self-funded and self-insured plans got to pass early on in the Affordable Care Act to say we're not going to regulate these. We've seen this with Hobby Lobby. You know, if anybody's asked the question, well, why is it Hobby Lobby can choose what birth control they can or can't have inside their plan? It's because they're uh, under a self-funded uh, model, right? So they technically get to write the plan, so to speak. So if you've ever worked for a large employer, FedEx, uh, you know, uh, Walmart, any large employer, if you ever worked for one of those, by and large, those plans are self-insured plans. Um, and so you may have, uh, you know, United on your card or Kaiser or Cigna or something on your card. Um, but really, the entity is the insurance company. The, the company you see on your card is, uh, they help administrate and manage claims and they do stop loss and stuff like that. So this for employers has been, uh, for the ones who've been savvy enough to either look into it or listen to it or, or you know, has been an escape route uh, in a lot of ways from the most onerous things about Obamacare, especially the penalties, the classifications around part-time and full, so many things that they have to deal with, um, they're getting uh, just I mean, out and out escape routes on it. There are some fees uh, that are assessed under uh, the Affordable Care Act to self-insured plans to help pay for the more expensive fully insured plans. Um, but again, inside of that, what, what they actually provide, and this is a very surface level description, but what they provide for the insurer, or for the, uh, for the employer, is the opportunity to get a refund on the difference between the actual costs and what the premium was. So if they were paying $100,000 in premiums, but they only had $50,000 in costs, $50,000 can come back to uh, to their organization. We're seeing this in, um, in, in recommending it to county governments. Um, we're seeing this in, um, in uh, large employers, small employers. Their insurance market has, it used to be only available in um, employer sizes that were about 100 employees and up. In response to the Affordable Care Act, the insurance market basically said, well, we know one way we can innovate is we can push this down to five employees. So that has been um, just a, a phenomenal way for, for people to kind of start to escape Obamacare. But remember that EPO, direct model care? You can actually work that into a self-insured market or self-insured plan because you're able to determine what the plan does and how it works. So you can effectively not only give somebody, you know, the large, um, you know, PPO with thousands and thousands of doctors and stuff that they want, but you're also able to control costs through the direct medical care uh, uh, function and uh, allow them to, to you know, create low pricing, good pricing, uh, effective plans, get a refund, and not be in Obamacare. And that, I think, is probably where we're going to continue to see the biggest innovations. Um, and so um, is, is in the employer marketplace. By and large, I think we're going to continue to see people um, obtaining insurance for their employer. So um, we're going to need, to work, I mean, the networks are going to get a lot of pressure. So, I mean, as, you know, constituents of, of employers, we need to put pressure on our employers to be innovative, uh, to look for, uh, if, I, if I'm an employee and I don't want Obamacare, I need to go to my employer and say, I need health insurance. But, you know, I need you to look for, you know, some of these ways out that we're able to, to have. But we can't, you can't get them without your employer, right? And that's the, that's kind of where the rub is. So, um, I think, I think the more um, insurance agents get educated, and the, I mean, most of them are not. Um, 220 some odd thousand insurance agents across the country went out of work with the passing of Obamacare. So, wow. um, I mean, it, it, you know, it, it basically took the, you know, distribution model, I mean, it just, it, it just crippled it. Um, and so the people that are in it now are generally newer, not as educated, you know. Some of them, you know, uh, who are still doing it are just kind of doing it and not really there's, because there's changes every week and a half or so, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's it, it, it's not, most of them don't make enough money on it for to, to pay attention. 
So um, if somebody walks in their office and says, I need to buy health insurance, they go, okay, great, here's Blue Cross Blue Shield, which one do you want? Boom, there you go. And you know, and they're out the door, nobody's paying attention. There, there's not enough money for them to be innovative. innovative. And so they don't uh, keep up. And uh, and so and that's been a shame, you know, but that's I mean that's how you know economics